Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful day of kinetics. So today we're going to be talking about uh, reactions that are a little bit more complicated than the systems that we've addressed before, just to give a little bit more practice and idea of how uh, we can apply our basic kinetic principles, specifically the steady state approximation, to more complicated systems. So the first reaction we're going to be talking about today is the reaction of a diatomic molecule with two other reagent molecules to produce a product species. And we're going to be dealing with a rather uh, uh, interesting elementary uh, set of elementary steps. The first is this diatomic molecule needs to actually decompose to form an intermediate A in order to actually completely react. So this can often be found with a lot of species like peroxides, where we have a high energy reactant that can split up to form two high energy intermediates that can then propagate a reaction. In this case, each of our uh, intermediate, uh, uh, intermediate A molecules can then interact with our other reagent B to produce a product in a second step. So we're going to want to try and examine the reaction, uh, um, uh, this reaction mechanism. But in order to do so, we first have to acknowledge we have a pesky little intermediate. And as we've seen previously, trying to address intermediate concentrations can be a bit messy. So we're going to start by trying to use the steady state approximation. Assume that intermediate A is fairly high energy and fairly short lived. So I can focus by looking at the rate of formation and consumption of A, and then setting that equal to zero. So in this case, we can generate uh, A first by the degradation of our original precursor diatomic molecule. And so this will occur as uh, with a rate of um, our diatomic concentration times the rate constant for this initiation step. However, here we run into a slightly, um, a slightly interesting uh, problem. And that's the fact that this reaction isn't going to generate a single A molecule. Instead, it generates two A molecules. So I'm going to have to essentially double the input at this rate because this reaction will produce uh, two A molecules. So it's going to have an outsized effect. Similarly, we also are going to have the reverse reaction in which these two A molecules can then uh, combine and reform my initial um, uh, diatomic uh, reactant. And so this is going to have, not too surprisingly, a rate of um, our reverse uh, the rate constant for the reverse reaction times the concentration of A squared, because again, it's a second order reverse reaction. However, here we also have to acknowledge that this reaction is consuming two A molecules. So we're going to have to double the effect of this reaction. However, we do have one other reaction that can consume A, thus another negative sign. And that's essentially A combining with B to drive my uh, the eventual formation of my product. And this is going to happen with a rate as uh, based on the rate constant for the second uh, step of the reaction, and again, being first order in both A and B. So this is a little bit kind of an interesting system. But one of the reasons I want to really bring it up is to focus in on what do we do when we generate, when we have a reaction that either generates uh, two or more or consumes two or more of an intermediate. And that's where these coefficients can start to play, uh, play a role. However, this uh, reaction mechanism is also particularly pesky in the fact that it turns out this term is second order in A, this term is first order in A, and this term is zeroth order in A. So trying to solve for the concentration of my intermediate A is a bit problematic, but hopefully some of you will spot the form. Yep, it's the quadratic rule. <laughs> so. We can go ahead and fit it into our quadratic formula, where this is going to be my C. This here, including the negative sign, is going to be the A. And negative K2B is going to form my 
uh, my B in the quadratic formula. So we then go ahead and plug this whole thing into the quadratic formula, which I know everyone's excited to do. And, and so what you can then do is you unfortunately have to solve each one of these versions independently, which again is slightly problematic. However, it is worth noting that while using the quadratic formula, uh, here I chose to use the negative sign in the plus and minus of the square root, because you'll notice we have a negative sign in the denominator. So that means that this whole top expression is going to have to be negative to cancel out the negative on the bottom. So now I have my concentration of A. But why on earth was I doing this to begin with? Well, that's because it's the second step of the reaction, which is gonna actually generate product. So I'm gonna to need to insert this whole expression into my expression for the rate of product formation, which again, is gonna be based on um, the rate constant for the second step of the reaction times my new wonderful concentration of A times B. And again, I do wanna emphasize here, that my new concentration of A is solely in terms of reactants, uh, of reactants, specifically B and my diatomic uh, A. However, you may notice that this is ex not exactly an equational form I wanna use all the time. So there has to be another simpler way I can describe this reaction mechanism. So this is at the point where we try and make a certain degree of approximations. Most specifically, as you might be able to see from the form, it's most likely here that the second step of the reaction is rate limiting. So if I am able to treat the second reaction as rate limiting, this means I can treat this first step as being in pre-equilibria. So again, this is going to require a fairly low rate constant for K2. However, if I am able to approximate the second step is sufficiently slow, well then this first step is again in pre-equilibria and I can describe it with the rate constant. In this case, uh, my equilibrium constant is gonna be given as the ratio of my forward over reverse rates, which is also gonna be equal to the ratio of the concentrations in the reaction, products again over reactants. So I can then go ahead and solve this form for A which again gives me a concentration of A in terms of the square root of the ratio of my rate constants for this pre-equilibrated reaction times the concentration of my diatomic intermediate or uh, reactant. So we can then plug this into the, uh, our rate equation for the generation of the product. And at this point, when we go ahead and simplify out the system, you'll notice there's something actually rather interesting. This reaction is first order in B. That's nothing too surprising. We found a lot of first order reactions as we've gone along. But what's really fascinating is that it's half order. Because again, it's the uh, uh, my diatomic A, where we can also describe the system as being our diatomic molecule to the one half power. And I want to illustrate this as it turns out that we often think of reaction rates as being zero with first, second, maybe even a third or fourth order. But it's entirely possible you may get rate orders of one half, even the occasional one third or two third. However, one half rate orders are often quite common when you have a system such as this, where you have a diatomic molecule that essentially breaks apart. And it turns out there's a lot more of these in nature than you'd expect. So for example, I've encountered more than my fair share of reactions that are half order in hydrogen because the H2 is often going to break up on some sort of metal catalyst to give you each of our hydride, um, each of our H atoms, which can then progress in the reaction. You'll occasionally see very similar behavior with things like O2, which is all over reaction systems, especially in oxidation. So again, don't be too surprised if you happen to see a half order show up here or there. It often indicates you have some sort of molecule either breaking apart or alternatively, you'll occasionally see these when you have a side reaction 
uh, artificially lowering the, uh, the effective concentration of one of our reactant molecules. But again, it is quite, a, uh, quite an interesting situation to run into. The other uh, reaction I wanna go ahead and describe uh, today is a decomposition of dinitrogen uh, pentoxide. So again, this is a nice gaseous nitrogen molecule, which can thermally decompose into um, nitrogen uh, dioxide and O2. So again, this is a classic sort of decomposition reaction. However, the reaction mechanism itself is a little bit interesting as it occurs in uh, essentially three main steps. So the first is that my nitrogen, uh, dinitrogen pentoxide can essentially split apart into <coughs> nitrogen trioxide and nitrogen dioxide with a rate constant of K1, but the reverse reaction can also occur with a reaction of K1 prime. However, it's also possible for these same reactants, uh, same intermediates, NO2 and NO3, to combine to also, uh, to also form NO2, O2, and NO, and NO. And I know this one seems a little bit odd because NO2 is both a reactant and a product, but again, it acts as a way to essentially break apart the nitrogen tetroxide, sorry, nitrogen trioxide uh, into oxygen and nitric oxide. However, now that we have this nitrogen uh, oxide as a reactive intermediate, it's also possible for this to go ahead and uh, combine and react with my dinitrogen pentoxide to form three NO2 molecules. Essentially, it splits the whole thing, um, the, the whole thing apart. So in this case, let's go ahead and start by making sure we know who our reactants are and who our products are. So our reactant is just this nitrogen, uh, dinitrogen pentoxide, which shows up here in our uh, forward reaction for the first step, our reverse reaction for the first step, and also in the forward reaction for our third decomposition step. NO2 shows up, not too surprisingly, pretty much everywhere. And this is again an important species because this is the product that we're generating. O2 is a side product, which only shows up in this second reaction. However, we also have a couple of important intermediates we should identify. Nitrogen trioxide, which shows up in reaction and the first step, both in the forward and reverse directions, as well as in the second step. And then we have nitrogen, nitric oxide, which shows up as a product in the second reaction and a reactant in the third reaction. So again, these are our two key high energy intermediates we have to handle. So let's go ahead and try and figure out how we can describe the rate law for the decomposition of our dinitrogen pentoxide. So again, we have to first identify which reactions are producing and which ones are consuming. So we have um, two reactions that are consuming our uh, dinitrogen pentoxide. That's the forward reaction, K1, which just depend, is just first order in dinitrogen pentoxide. But we also have this third reaction with a rate constant of K3. I should have changed that and is first order in nitrogen pentoxide and first order in nitric oxide. And then it's essentially uh, produced in the reverse reaction of our first step with a reaction with a rate constant of K1 prime and is again first order in, di in nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen trioxide. However, this doesn't yet a rate law make as it's dependent upon the concentration of two major intermediates that I have to substitute out, namely nitric oxide and nitrogen trioxide. So let's go ahead and start by trying to solve for the concentration of, nitri of nitric oxide. So this is again formed in the forward step of reaction two and is consumed in the forward step of reaction three with again the related dependence upon nitrogen dioxide and trioxide for the second step and on just the reactant 
uh, dinitrogen pentoxide for the third step. But we can also make use of the um, um, of steady of steady state to set this whole rate equal to zero, and assuming that we've reached after an initial induction period steady state nitric oxide. So that lets us go ahead and rearrange and solve this equation for the nitrogen oxide concentration, mo namely by moving uh, this term over to the right hand side and the dividing by our rate constant and our the concentration of nit dinitrogen pentoxide. So again, with <clears throat> this lets us calculate the concentration of nitric oxide. Unfortunately, we still have a leftover dependence on the concentration of nitrogen trioxide, which again is still an intermediate. So I have to also solve for the concentration of nitrogen trioxide, which we can again solve using the steady state approximation by looking at how we can form and consume nitrogen trioxide. So we can produce nitrogen trioxide from again, the forward reaction of our first step, but the reverse reaction as well as reaction two can also consume this nitrogen trioxide. <clears throat> Again, these two reactions being, uh, these two consumption reactions being first order and nitrogen tri uh, trioxide, but, uh, and both being for also first order and nitrogen uh, dioxide, though with different rate constants of K1 prime and K, uh, K2 respectively. So again, using steady state, I can set this whole expression equal to zero and then try and isolate all my nitrogen trioxide terms by moving them over to the other side and then combining their shared, uh, combining their coefficients as K1 prime plus K2. And again, they both share first order behavior in nitrogen dioxide. So I can divide by these whole shared terms on the denominator while the numerator is again the uh, the generation reaction of the reaction rate for the first step times the concentration of dinitrogen pentoxide. So that gives us our, four, our three forward steps and one uh, reverse step reaction. Gives us a set of equations to describe the concentration of both nitric oxide and nitrogen trioxide. However, again, as pointed out, we have to watch out because nitric oxide still is, uh, still has a concentration dependence of nitrogen trioxide. So we'll have to substitute in our, equal, our expression for the nitrogen trioxide concentration. However, it's not as bad as it looks, mostly because we start to see a lot of cancellation. Namely, that uh, by inserting in our nitric Nitri tri nitrogen trioxide expression, the dinitrogen pentoxide terms end up canceling out, as well as the NO2 expressions. This leaves me with pretty much a big old mass of rate constants, K1 times K2, all divided by K3 times the sum of K1 prime and K2. So armed with these two expressions for the equilibrium uh, for the steady state concentrations of our two intermediates, we can go ahead, head back and retackle the rate law for the consumption of our N2O5 uh, reactant species. So again, we can substitute in uh, our combination of rate constants in for nitric oxide and our more complicated nitrogen trioxide expression as well. And at this point, what we're going to have to start looking for is some useful kind of cancellations. So here we can spot in our second term, our K3s should end up, uh, should end up uh, canceling out. Well, as in our third term, we notice that NO2 is shared both in the uh, numerator and the denominator, so that will also essentially fall out of the system. However, here's where we run into the more problematic uh, phase, because that means that these two, my second and third term, both share a common denominator of K1 prime plus K2. My first term does not. 
However, since they all share first order behavior in dinitrogen pentoxide, I really wanna essentially combine these three terms together. However, in order to do that, that means I have to multiply my first term by essentially one or the sum of K1, uh, K1 prime plus K2 over K1 prime plus K2. And by doing this, now we actually get in a little bit of luck because I can then combine the numerators of these expressions. Now what gets really fun is what happens to the numerator for this first term, as it's gonna generate two, uh, two expressions. First, negative K1 prime K1 times N2O5. Well, it turns out that that's gonna be the same as this uh, third term. So these two will end up just canceling out, negative plus. But we also have negative K1, K2, N2O5, which is also the numerator for the second term. So these will end up essentially adding together. And I end up having a uh, rate of, again, consumption, notice this negative sign, based on the product of uh, the forward reactions for my first and second step, but essentially slowed down or reduced by the sum of, uh, of the reverse reaction plus this, K, uh, this K2 step. And you'll notice that it's a little bit surprising, but K3 will actually not play a major role here. So again, Though this is a little bit of a long example, it does illustrate how you can end up generating some rather interesting uh, reaction dynamics. Most notably, I do want to note that, again, this is for just the reactant species. The rate law for the production of NO2 will be a little bit more fun. But there's also another very cool feature I want to focus in on. And that happens that to be that despite all of this work, and while only making the steady state approximation, we end up showing that the consumption of our reactant is indeed first order in our reactant, despite all these additional side pathways. However, that said, I do wanna point out that while experimentally we would just assign this a rate constant of KR, in reality, the rate constant based on elementary steps is a lot more complex. In this case, it's two times the product, again, of these two rate constants divided by the sum of these two rate constants. And this is indeed something to kind of be aware of how uh, to be aware of is just how complicated some of these reaction dynamics can get. So next time we're going to play around with a, uh, with a couple more applications of complex reaction mechanisms, specifically focusing in on high energy intermediates. Until then, take care.